the thing that's maybe the most surprising that, um, to my understanding, maybe even goes against some prior polling that asked similar questions has to do with non-voters or people who are, you know, low information, you know, who don't vote often, infrequent voters, um, people who are pretty thoroughly depoliticized or not very active politically, just this big mesh of, of categories. And uh, it, what it seems to say in the data, and uh, curious how you understand what this means, uh, both just like what the actual data is saying, and then maybe what this means for politics or political strategy, um, that there's a that these people that are you know not active politically are actually not these you know uh, hidden social democrats or something that they you know even though opinion polling says people want Medicare for all, that people who don't vote uh, that are they're they're basically moderates is how I've understood that or we shouldn't assume that they are just like progressives waiting to be or something that um, now again I'm curious how you understand that uh, because it also seems like because they're not very politically active that that category of not progressive is maybe only you know it's not very deep it's not a it's not a very deep commitment to anything because it's just it's the lack of a political commitment and so I'm in some ways, I'm, I'm curious, you know, does that just mean we just have to organize that much harder, uh, you know, that we, we rely on, you know, a lot of this information of our data, of our, of our theories, of our political practice, our experience and say, no, actually, we can win these people, but it's going to take work. Yeah, that I mean, that's basically that's basically the takeaway it, it, you put very well. I mean, I think that we definitely find, you know, Many of us, Bernie bros from, you know, last year, well, for, you know, the last many years, in some cases, um, are, were thinking, just as Bernie was saying, that if you go out there and you give, you know, a message that's really robust social democratic message that's not being, you know, offered by mainstream Democrats, that, you know, a lot of people that don't vote are going to come out and vote. And because, and, th and that they, the implication being that they don't vote because, they don't see candidates out there that are reflected, you know, that reflect their views, right? That, that reflect their political positions, right? And that is essentially not supported at all. And that's not particularly, that's, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, in contradiction to other sort of political science research. But basically, it is a really important point to, to note that the folks that are non-voters and our working class folks that are like low propensity. So you can measure this in different ways, but, you know, basically people that haven't turned out for recent elections, uh, including the 2020 presidential election, those folks are, they're not conservative. Like they're just not any different than uh, other Democrats who already vote. Right. So the implication being that, you know, if you just go out there like Bernie style and, and offer a message that sounds really great, like that's not going to do much. Right. And Bernie unfortunately found that himself. Um, it, and like you said, Kill, it doesn't mean that these sort of voters that don't go out and vote like that they can't be won over. Uh, but it's going to take a lot more than what progressives have been saying for in recent years. Like, mm -hmm. well, you know, we can do this by, you know, better messaging and offering a kind of politics that's not being offered by Democrats. It's going to take it's going to take a lot longer term uh, vision in order to genuinely change the nature of the electorate. And the difficult trade off there, I think the implication being that, you know, unfortunately, we have to trade off thinking about is our primary focus to try to invest in that long term strategy of making inroads with those non voters so that 10, 20 years down the road or however many years we have that more stable working class coalition that incorporates these non-voters or how much do we have to focus today and tomorrow on trying to win over current voters who are currently voting for other types of more conservative Democrats or voting for Republicans. So that's a difficult trade-off and there's really no easy solution for it. And more than anything else, you know, the finding that we have here is just highlighting the difficulty of a strategy that focuses on non-voters and it highlights the need for shifting the focus to longer term kinds of organizing that might more effectively reach those folks.
I want to ask you now about the types of candidates that respondents uh, seem to prefer, because that was an interesting part of the poll as well, that you actually included these hypothetical candidates, uh, including, you know, their class background and their gender and their race. So I thought what was interesting about the study is that you basically found that um, working class voters don't really seem to care that much about a candidate's race or gender. Um, and actually, I think that there have been, you know, sort of prior polls and prior studies that have confirmed that as well. Uh, like, I think in 2020, you know, uh, Gallup or like some other polling firm uh, asked a bunch of people whether they cared about the race or gender of the presidential candidate. And I think only like upper class whites said that they cared, right? Like everybody else was like, it doesn't matter. Like I just care about like what they stand for and their policies. Um, but in your study, you found that uh, working class candidates, or I'm sorry, working class voters seem to prefer working class candidates. So can you talk a little bit more about that part in your study and, and why this is so important? Yeah, so, I mean, we're not the first, as you mentioned, we're not the first people to look at the uh, ways, the reactions that working class voters have to candidates from different class backgrounds. There actually hasn't, even in political science, there hasn't been a lot of work on this, but there's been some. But we were able to look at, you know, the class background of both candidates and voters in a more rigorous way than is normally the case, partly because we were able to measure the working class, uh, you know, in, in terms of the voters in a whole bunch of different ways, which is not normally what you see in, in these sorts of studies. And also we were able to look at several different types of candidates and their in their sort of class background, and we had a couple that were from you know broadly sort of working class backgrounds, which was teacher and construction worker, and we had a couple that were from uh, sort of like a more middle class background. Uh, so that was sort of lawyer and small business owner, and then we had one which was just like upper class, which was CEO, right? And we found that uh, no matter how you measure the working class. Um, candidates that come from a working class background uh, do a lot better than uh, candidates that come from an upper class background or that come from an upper middle class background, that is to say the lawyer. So if you're a construction worker or a teacher, you are golden in terms of working class voters. Although interestingly, as you get more conservative in the um, respondents, so among independents and lean Republicans, there is an increasing preference for the for the working for the construction worker variants of the working class candidate relative to the teacher. And as you get more liberal, there's an increasing preference for the teacher variants of the working class relative to the construction worker. And so we can I mean, there's some obvious reasons why that might be the case, I think. Uh, but in general, the sort of uh, CEO and the lawyer, uh, you know, do really, really, really badly. So, you know, our key takeaway in light, you know, in con consistent with some other recent studies is that running candidates, you know, who are working class is going to pay political dividends if you're trying to reach working class voters. The only slight caveat to that is that small business owners are clearly, you know, and I I can sense this just from, you know, my own life, like people don't think of small business owners as necessarily not of the working class, like sort of culturally, you know, because they're just sort of like our cousins and maybe they don't have a high educational background. And so small business owners were favored almost as well as the as the sort of more traditional working class candidates. So that's the only sort of caveat. Um, and then in terms of the race and gender of candidates, you're right that previous studies have shown that the race and gender doesn't matter. Although there's some there's some controversy over that, but but you're right that in general there's there's an increasing consensus that the race and gender of a candidate doesn't really have much bearing on whether or not they can uh, do well in an election. That said, uh, we find interestingly that black uh, candidates did did the black female candidates in particular were the most popular candidates, not just among uh, you know, African-Americans or anybody else, but also among whites, even among white men. And so there's actually a benefit, according to our data here, uh, and it's not super shocking given that this is, you know, a group that leans more Democrat, uh, that running as, you know, somebody that's from a, you know, African-American community or for who's, who's um, African-American female in particular, that that's not even, that's not a liability, that's an asset. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not totally, you know, um, out of line with some of the more high profile, you know, examples of progressives in the last couple of years, you know, who have done right. really well coming from those sorts of communities. 
Great. So to all the DSA chapters out there considering endorsing CEOs and lawyers, put those endorsements to the side, pick up some India Waltons. Thinking about the future, you know, looking at where candidates have run in, in the past and, and, you know, where should the, the left be focused geographically around the country? Um, you know, how, how do we understand, you know, our prospects in rural America and, uh, and, I don't know if this, if the data really bears this out, but like, I know some of your other kind of work generally has been like, you know, proposing ideas around, you know, where does the left focus its efforts uh, geographically in the country? Yeah, I mean, you're right about the rural voters historically being, you know, important parts of sort of like, um, you know, urban, rural, you know, populist, social democratic coalitions. Uh around the world and particularly, you know, famous examples like in Northern Europe and Canada um, and even in the US uh, during the populist period um, and during the New Deal. Uh, but, you know, the reason why we need to focus on, I mean, just to, you know, brass tacks, the reason why we need to focus on rural voters now is not necessarily because they're the most promising, uh, you know, potential coalition partner for, for progressive uh, uh, politicians. That's in fact not the case. Um, if we had a country that was just one big congressional district, you know, where we had just proportional representation, that would not be our strategy. That would be a crazy strategy uh, because we could just mm -hmm. win every election by focusing on the Democratic base, which is already a majority of you know voters in the entire country. Um, but unfortunately, we live in the United States. Well, you know, unfortunately, in this sense, which is to say that we have these sorts of districts and, and states uh, that have boundaries which make rural voters and small town voters who tend to be more conservative than other voters, tend to be more white than other voters, disproportionately impactful. And that's always been the case. Um, it, you know, there's a great book by Jonathan Rodden. If, if anybody's willing to put up with the political science -y stuff, like it's called Why Cities Lose. And it goes through the history of the 20th century talking about this divide. It's super interesting. And, you know, the basic point is today, if we don't find a way to make inroads into rural and small town areas that are more conservative, we cannot build a coalition in the House and even in the Senate that can deliver the kinds of majorities needed to win the things that we care about. And we're seeing that right now when it comes to the Build Back Better bill. Like if somehow Joe Manchin, you know, we could find a wonderful candidate that, you know, had all the things that we like and they beat Joe Manchin and they were like a Bernie crowd. Like that one change would basically reshape, you know, the future of democratic politics in terms of, you know, the next generation of social policy, which, you know, could have been one thing this year, but will end up being another thing because, well, there's many reasons, but, you know, it could have been different if we had been able to focus on winning, taking seriously how to win in those sorts of areas where we can with the right sorts of messaging. I'm not saying we could have won West Virginia this year, but you get the broader point. And so that's why we need to focus on these rural voters. And, I mean, there's also a, a, an important point just with respect to the future of democracy in our country, I think, which is to say, if we just write off, you know, rural, small town, you know, white, you know, more conservative voters, then we're just sort of consigning them to the, to the far right for no reason, right? These are like people that have feelings and they're normal people in a lot of ways, you know, they're just different from us and some of the views and backgrounds. And if we just say we're, we're just going to write them off and we're going to try to consolidate a, a liberal coalition that doesn't include any of those voters, then we are just making the feeding ground for, you know, far right political organizing even stronger. And we need to address that from not just an electoral standpoint, but also from a, like the future of democracy sort of standpoint. Yeah. So there are other reasons to focus on those folks in addition to just the sort of brass electoral taxes. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.